good afternoon everyone. So today we're going to have uh, Dr. Ali Akbar Imani. Eh? Dr. Ali Akbar Imani uh, is a senior lecturer at Language Academy. Uh, so he just joined us after his PhD. His PhD was in the field of metaphor analysis. Uh, having published articles and book chapters and talk in conferences, uh, his main interest is critical discourse analysis, CDA. I'm not very sure uh, whether our friends from Korea, are you familiar with CDA? And uh, he looks at the effects of metaphor on our cognition. For example, the way metaphor is understood in our minds or the way it can be used to change our worldview. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, topic. So how we look at uh, metaphors, how metaphors uh, uh, affect us, our daily life. Yeah. So without further ado, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Ali Akbar Imani to present his talk on customer's mind using ZMAT. Is it ZMAT, ZMAT metaphor elicitation technique as a research? But uh, I pass to you, uh, Dr. Ali. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hanita. So um, thank you for joining me um, for this talk. So I'm going to talk about customer's mind using ZMET, metaphor elicitation technique as a research tool. But um, before I start, I would like to give a little bit of background about myself. So years ago, I was working in a market research firm in Iran. And so we had customers, and our customers were uh, domestic and international companies. So they wanted us to gather and analyze data about consumers, about Iranian consumers. So for example, what are their preferences about a product? So we had a lot of companies, for example, some of the electrical devices companies like Samsung, LG, and also some of the Iranian companies, some of the car brands, so what did we do in the, in the market research firm? We designed and we implemented surveys, focus group discussions, interviews. And so then we analyzed the data. So we designed the data collection methods, we implemented them, and then we analyzed the data. We prepared a report. And then after that, we sent them our reports and they launched a new product tailored for the Iranian consumers. So my job there was a translator. So I was pretty much involved in everything they did from the moment the company sent us the email, I translated that from English into Persian. And then um, during the whole process, I was also involved in translating. Uh, for example, some of the surveys were from English into Persian. And finally the report I translated from uh, Persian to English and I sent back to the companies. So anyway, after the companies, uh, sometimes, for example, they came up with a product tailored for the Iranian consumers based on their preferences. So they put it in the market, but what happened? The people didn't buy them. So then um, at that point, then the companies actually got back to us for the second phase of research. So they asked us to do more research. For example, we had to contact the people again and ask them what do they think about the product or for example, why uh, they are not buying the product. So at that time, because I was a new member of that organization, of that firm, so I was, uh, uh, the first thing I asked myself was, what are we doing wrong? Or for example, are we doing anything wrong? Because in our data analysis, the customer said, for example, we want this type of this type of product, but after it was put in the market, then they didn't buy that. So then I asked one of my managers the question, and then this is what he answered me. He said that only 20% of the times this kind of research is successful. And then at that moment, it was a relief for me, but then it, it actually led to another question, which was, why do the customers say one thing and they act differently? So that was the question that at that moment came to my mind. But that time I wasn't doing PhD, so I just left it. Until years later, I came to Malaysia and I studied metaphor analysis 
So I became familiar with metaphor. And then in line with my research, I came to this article by Gerald Zaltzman, how customers think essential insights into the minds of the market. So in that article, he pretty much answered my question. And so this is what I am going to share with you here today. So the question is, why do the customers say one thing and act differently? And then how can we address this issue? So uh, what do customers want? Uh, so that is basically the first question that every company would like to find the answer to. How do companies try to answer this question? What, what is it that customers or consumers want them to do? So they usually collect and analyze data, for example, such as focus group discussions, surveys, and interviews. But what is the result? Usually customers all excitedly talk about a new product. For example, they say we want a personal digital assistant and that they cannot wait to buy it. But when it is placed in the market, they decide, simply they decide they don't really need to need one. So what are the effects on the companies? The companies have spent years of costly research, hundreds of thousands of dollars they spend. And then when a new project is launched, they see that it is ignored in the marketplace. So at this point, I am not very much worried about the losses by the companies, but the question that I would like to ask and answer is, why do customers do that? Why do they say something and they act differently? So, and then uh, maybe we can actually address this issue. If we want to answer this issue, then we have to ask a bigger question. The question would be, how do customers think? And of course, if you want to answer this question, then we will come to a much bigger question. How does our mind work? So generally, in terms of the way our mind works, there are six um, misconceptions or there are six common myths in the market research. There are six things that they are doing wrong in the market research. Number one, Consumers think in well-reasoned linear ways as they evaluate products. Well, actually, this is the first link, the first myth in the, in the market research where they don't do that. For example, consumers, they don't consciously uh, assess a car's benefits attribute by attribute, and then they decide whether to buy it or not. Instead, their emotions, the desire for happiness, prestige, and so on play a bigger role than the logic in the purchase decision. So for example, we can, we can talk about a person purchasing a high performance sports car uh, is not just buying a device to convey him from one place to another. In purely rational terms, the purchase doesn't make very much economic sense because after all the speed limits uh, uh, prevent the driver from reaching the, type of, the top of speed on the speedometer. So he cannot drive 100,000 Porsche faster than a 20,000 Porsche. So, well, so basically, it is not a reasonable purchase. So that is the first myth in the market research that they believe that the customers think in well-reasoned linear ways as they evaluate the product. And of course, this is not true. Then the second myth, would be that consumers can plausibly explain their thinking and behavior. This is the second mistake in the market research. In reality, 95% of thinking takes place in our unconscious minds. So people use conscious thought primarily as a way to rationalize behavior. But the fact is that our behavior is mostly influenced by our unconscious mind. So the fact that we think that the customers plausibly explain their thinking and uh, behavior is the second myth in the market research. So the third myth would be the customer's minds, brains, bodies, and surrounding culture can be studied independently of one another. So that is not true because as we all know, the mind, brain, and external world, they interact with each other and they help shape one another. Then the fourth myth would be consumers' memories accurately 
reflect their experiences. So this is the fourth means because researchers, uh, some of the people believe that the customers, that our memories accurately reflect our experience, but this is not true. Research reveals that memory is not perfect. And in fact, it changes over time. Even it changes depending on the situation. For example, some of the things which were very sad experiences or painful experiences a long time ago, if we think about them, then we don't have that feeling anymore. Even the situation can actually influence our memories. For example, when people are asked to recall an experience, their memories are influenced by the sequence in which the questions are asked. And even the color of the paper on which the survey is printed can also have, might also affect their memories. The fifth misconception would be consumers think primarily in words. The fact is that only a small portion of the brain's neural activity ultimately surfaces in the language. So the unconscious thought is basically nonverbal. It involves mental activity, but primarily at the level of impulses and managery images. So uh, this is basically why metaphor is a very good device to a study unconscious mind because they work in the same way. The sixth misconception would be consumers can receive company messages and interpret them correctly. So this is actually uh, an idea that consumers are passive, but this is not true. They do not passively absorb messages. They constantly reinterpret the messages in terms of the unique experiences. So after this, then uh, based on these six misconceptions, so we cannot achieve truly insightful consumer analysis by only scratching the surface of thought and behavior. So to understand the consumers, we really have to dig further into their thought. And by the interview, uh, by the traditional interview, sometimes we cannot do that. For example, on the surface, a person purchasing a car is just buying a device to convey him from one place to another. So if we ask him, this is what he will tell us. And he will say that, for example, the price of the gas is very important or the speed is very important to him. But in reality, unconsciously, the sports car makes a statement about the owner's personal identity, perhaps regarding youthfulness, daringness, sexiness, or aggressiveness. As another example, for example, cost consumers make purchases whose real purpose they unconsciously try to conceal. This is also the thing that sometimes happens. For example, you can consider people who buy expensive chocolate products. For example, you can think about a senior citizen who buys a chocolate only based on the shape that, for example, is like a heart. When you ask them, they often indicate it's a gift to others. However, in-depth research finds that it's usually intended for personal consumption. So unconsciously, they think that it is not appropriate for them, so they try to conceal it. So the purchase is tangled up in, in emotions of joy and guilt probably that the consumer may not even understand at the conscious level. All the person knows is that the sight of the box or the smell of the chocolate desires, uh, triggers a desire to buy. So all of this happens in our unconscious mind. So when we interview the customers, they are not themselves aware of the unconscious mind that triggers the action. So basically, that is why uh, their results will not be so correct. So how can we get the information about the unconscious mind? So the unconscious mind regularly reveals itself through metaphors. So that is why uh, metaphor is a very good research, research uh, device to study the unconscious mind. A metaphor is figurative language referring to the representation of one thing in terms of another. For instance, if a poet says, my love is a red, red rose, he doesn't mean that she's turning into a flower. He means that in sight and scent, she resembles a rose. We are always using metaphors, mainly because they establish connections, helping us interpret the world 
and make it understandable. So marketers benefit greatly by getting consumers to use metaphors about products. Metaphor can help bring unconscious thoughts and feelings to the surface. Metaphor can show the real connection consumers see between products and their own lives. Why do customers say one thing and act differently? So now at this point, we can answer the questions because basically what they say is based on their conscious mind and how they act is based on their unconscious mind. So that is why um, most of the time, in only 20% of the time, that kind of research yields correct and results. So considering the important role of metaphor in revealing our unconscious mind and considering the fact that most of what we decide to do happens in our unconscious mind, Zaltman offered a method to elicit response from the customers. However, I have to take a detour here. I have to talk about what is metaphor first. That should be for a few minutes, and then I will get back to, the, to my uh, topic again. So metaphor is basically a figure of a speech in which a concept is applied to another concept to which it is not literally applicable. So here we have basically two concepts. So metaphor is a comparison between two concepts. Now, number one, they must not be related. If they are of the same uh, type, then that shouldn't be a metaphor. And then the features of one of them is given to another one. So for example, if somebody says the boss is a tiger, so that is a metaphor. But then here we can see that metaphor has two elements, boss and tiger. So uh, in terms of metaphor, uh, technical terms we call the first one topic or target. That is what we try to describe. And the, ti uh, and the tiger is called the vehicle or the source. That is the source of metaphor. That is what we use to define the boss as the target of the metaphor. So the source uh, domain is the source of comparison. For example, the boss is a tiger. We use the tiger to describe the boss. Then the target domain is what we try to describe, that is the boss. So for example, life is traveling, discussion is war, love is building. They are all metaphors. And here, A or the target is understood in terms of B. So for example, life is understood in terms of traveling. And so that is metaphor because boss and tiger, they do not believe to the same category. One of them is human, one of them is a beast. Life and traveling, they are not in the same category. So love is a journey. So here we use journey to describe love. Now, I would like to talk about journey metaphor first because journey metaphor is basically one of the most frequently used metaphors in our everyday language. Also, I have noticed that journey metaphor is the most are frequently used metaphor in academia. So for example, love is a journey, life is a journey, PhD is a journey. For example, a husband tells his wife, uh, since we got married, we have had the most exciting journey. Or the father might tell his son, I am at the end of my journey. You have to continue this journey after me. Or the supervisor might say to his PhD student, you are just at the beginning of this journey. Now, uh, uh, I am planning to prepare um, uh, a talk about journey metaphor used in academia. All of these you can see here are posters shared by UTM, and all of them use journey. Of course, the number is much, much bigger than this. But then maybe in another talk, I talk about the reason why journey is such a um, popular metaphor. So for example, here we can see journey from engineering to entrepreneurship. So it means that the process of um, being an engineer to becoming an entrepreneur is described as a journey. Okay, as another one, this is also from UTM. So the journey and experience, professional engineer. So this one is also talking about the process of changing, of becoming a professional engineer, which she has described in terms of a journey. 
for this one um, in, um, by Prof. Vijay. Uh, actually, he was one of our uh, guest uh, speakers. I think it was in the it was last year, right? So here, messaging the research journey, managing the research journey. So here, research is uh, described in terms of journey. Another one, this is by Prof. Uh, Ahmad Fauzi, uh, our Naive uh, Chancellor of UTM. So also here we have this, this journey metaphor, the journey from being a student to becoming an administrator. This is another one, my journey, the joy, pain, and reward. And this is uh, another one, my journey to corporate world. So this is also another journey metaphor here used by Mr. Aminuddin Zakaria. Now I would like to see that I would like to um, change the or develop the initial definition of metaphor. If you look for the definition of metaphor, if you just look it up in a dictionary or if you just search for the meaning of metaphor online, then most probably this is what you will get. We use metaphors to describe a concept in terms of another concept, but I would like to develop it a bit more. I would like to say that we use metaphors to describe a new concept in terms of a familiar concept or an abstract concept in terms of a concrete or a complicated concept in terms of a simple concept. So what happens here? What is the purpose of metaphor to describe a concept? If this concept is a new concept, then we relate it to a familiar experience. If this concept is abstract, then we use a kind of concrete concept. Or if it is a complicated concept, then we will use a simple concept. A lot of the studies have been done here to show that metaphors actually do that. They help us understand the new concept. They help us understand the abstract and complicated concept. So for example, PhD, that can be a new concept for a master's student. Or for example, in the previous here, for example, the process of being an engineer to becoming an entrepreneur, that can be a new concept. Or for example, here to become a professional engineer or the research, this can be a new concept, which uh, Prof. Uh, Vijay tried to use the word journey to describe it. Or here, being a student to becoming an administrator. This is the process that Prof. Ahmad Fauzi tried to use the metaphor journey to describe it because journey is a familiar experience for all of us. We are all familiar with journey, but we are not familiar with the process of being a student to becoming an administrator. Or for example, here, my journey to corporate world. So here also we have the same, the same process from to become, uh, for example, the CEO of a company. So as we can see, all of these journey metaphors, they have a kind of process, the process which starts with an initial point, okay? And then we just get to a destination. So we start, and then we get to a destination. So the destination here is to be is becoming an administrator, becoming a professional engineer, or becoming the CEO of a company, so or becoming the Knight Chancellor of UTM. But then the other thing is that we have to actually look at it is that these uh, journey metaphors have different features, as I'm going to talk about it later. So uh, getting back to metaphor, for example, I say John is like a lion. That is a metaphor because John is a person, lion is a beast, so they are not related. And I try to describe John in terms of a lion. So I am going, how am I going to do that? How does it happen in our mind? In our mind, there are features of the lion that we assign to John. So basically, this metaphor, I can actually develop it. John is like a lion because, and then whatever you put here is called the ground. 
or the feature of the source that is assigned to the target because he is, for example, brave or because he is fierce and cruel because lion can be brave, lion can be fierce, lion can be cruel. So there are many different features of a lion, but which ones do or which one do we assign to John? Or for example, when I say, uh, for example, research journey. So research is like a journey because both are, for example, slow. I don't know, for example, both are goal-oriented. So then the, uh, the information that you give here is called the ground. But then the question is that in, for example, John is a lion or research is a journey, how do we know which attributes of the lion to assign to John or, for example, which attribute of the journey we assign to Mark? And the answer is familiarity with the target and or with the source. So I wouldn't be able to do that if I have no idea what is a research. But if I know what is a research, then I can actually find um, the features or characteristics of the research of the journey to assign to law. Or I also have to be familiar with the target. So if I know John, if I know he's a soldier, then I say so. He is like a lion, means he's a very brave person. If I know he's a bully, and I know that actually he's very fierce and he's cruel. So I need to know the concept of lion. That is the familiar concept. That is the whole point of metaphor. And then also sometimes some familiarity with the target would help. So metaphor influences our perceptions of the world. That is how we see the world. Metaphor influences our language, that is how we talk, and metaphor influences our actions based on the way we see the world. So metaphor uh, basically influences our perception and our action and our language. So metaphor influences our perceptions of the world, that is how we see the world. For example, if I see love as a journey, then I believe that there is a common destination to reach and that my partner is with me through this journey to arrive at this common destination. Now, this common destination can be getting married, having children, but then that is the way I see the world. And when I, I use the metaphor, I can convey this perception to other people. So they both, when we use metaphor, we see the world in a very special way. Uh, and also we can make others see the world in that way. Metaphor influences our actions, that is what we do. So if I see love as a journey, then I need to set a common destination. So it means that without this common destination, my love will, will not be considered as a journey. Now the common destination can be getting married or having children. And then the important thing is that me and my partner, we must both share the same common destination. Other than that, we will go our separate ways and it will not be a journey. And then we must also expect crossroads, forks, dead ends, and obstacles on the way, and we must become prepared for them. Okay, and then here, metaphor influences our language. So that is how we talk about our experiences. So for example, if I see love as a journey, then there are many, many phrases, many sentences that we can use. For example, our relationship came to a dead end. Look how far we have come. It has been a long, bumpy road. We cannot turn back now. We are at a crossroads. We may have to go our separate ways. The relationship isn't going anywhere. So why do we make these sentences? Because in all of them, the elements of love as a journey is present. So it means that we can only make these kind of phrases or sentences if we see love as a journey. Now, in different languages, we might have different expressions. I'm not sure, for example, in all of these languages, we have the same set of elements because the 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 a concept of journey may not be the same. For example, for the people living near the sea and the people living on top of a mountain, there might be differences in terms of the journey. 
So maybe, or also in terms of the structure of the language and, and vocabulary. So uh, probably, maybe they are not using the same metaphors, or maybe they are using the same set of metaphors. But what is important is that metaphor influences our language. So we can study metaphor by doing interview as well. So the impact of metaphor on our perception and action, this has been proved by many, many studies. For example, just one of them, uh, Thibodeau and Brodsky, 2011, they asked participants to think about a city. So they, actually, this is what they did. They, they had participants divided into two groups. And then for the first group of participants, they described crime as a beast. For the second group of participants, they described crime uh, as a disease. So for the first group, they said that crime is a beast. And then for the second group, they said that crime is a disease. And at the end of the, the study, they asked them uh, to give solutions. So the participants in the first group, they came up with very aggressive solutions like we have to kill uh, the criminals. But the participants in the second group, they came up with solutions such as, for example, we have to treat them because they are sick. So it means that the way we see the world is actually very much influencing our actions. So that is what happens in the customers and consumers. The way they see a product is actually um, influencing their action or behavior regarding that product. So metaphor is an effective research tool in identifying how the customers think because metaphors touch our unconscious mind. So basically, there are three ways to perform metaphor uh, research. Number one, using natural data. For example, I can analyze somebody's speeches or I can analyze a book. And number two, I can elicit metaphors from the people in the form of interviews. So here we have two different types of uh, techniques, verbal or visual interviews or visual data. So the first set of, uh, so the first method, naturally occurring metaphors are good. For example, if I want to study the speeches of the, of the prime minister. So this is what I did when I studied um, Dr. Mahadir's speeches. So I went through his speeches and I found metaphors and then I found patterns. This is basically a very, very effective uh, method, but it needs a large amount of data so that you can find patterns. But then when I want to do the interview with a few people, and then uh, I don't have a lot of time, maximum one hour or two hours, then I cannot really um, base my study on naturally occurring metaphors. So I just let them to talk, and then I wait for them to make a metaphor about my topic of research. So here we go to metaphor elicitation technique, which is two types. The first type is verbal. And so that is done by asking a set of questions. For example, what is PhD like to you? Or in what way it is so? So for example, they can say that PhD is like a journey. And I say, why? In what way? And they say, for example, because there is a journey, there is a destination. So what is, what, where do you see yourself in this journey? And they say, for example, I am the traveler. Okay, where do you see uh, or how do you see your supervisor here? So, for example, they can say he, he or she is my guide. So you see that I can, we can ask a set of questions so that they can transfer the image to us. Or we can simply ask them. Uh, can you show me a picture that represents PhD is a journey? Now, uh, it is very interesting because first we might think that, okay, so um, PhD is a journey is something very uh, normal, but then when the people give, um, when the people give pictures, then we will have a lot of different type of pictures. So here, this is what I did. I asked a few people uh, to provide me PhD as a journey. And then these are, uh, of course, uh, the number of the pictures was much more than this, but then these are some of the things that they provided me. This was one of them. This is another one. This is another one. 
So you see that simply PhD is a journey, but there are things in the image that uh, are, are not easily expressed into words. This one. So I have selected just a few images for, your, um, for you to see. And this one. So as we can see here, is the image necessarily the same for all of us, even though all of us, we say that PhD is a journey, or for example, uh, from being a student to becoming an administrator is a journey, but is the journey the same for all of us? So the answer is no, it isn't. There are, of course, some common features. For example, a journey has a destination. A journey shows a process of changing, but then there are things that are not the same. For example, in one of the images, we can see meeting other people or the confusion or not being alone or here um, just so desperate and hopeless or here there is hope, there is, there is the light at the end of this road or here it can be like uh, going to the top or achieving heights and here can be a safe journey, very enjoyable journey. So it can be a smooth or hard trip, the importance of guidance or a hopeful or a hopeless situation, et cetera, et cetera. Even if I would like to have a look at this poster, which I showed you before. So in this poster, if we look, we can see the element of flight. Of course, in the other posters, I couldn't find it, but this poster shows that this type of journey is the journey by airplane. So there are special features can be assigned to the uh, journey of, uh, by airplane. For example, sense of excitement, or that it's very fast, or that you can achieve heights, and et cetera. But that is not in the scope of this talk today. So let's get back to our discussion. So this is the problem in the market research. Historically, marketers have gained knowledge about customers' uh, decision-making through means, such as interviews, focus groups, and questionnaires. So these approaches rely on self-reflection and, and awareness. But the fact is that a large part of our thought, emotion, and even learning occurs in the unconscious mind. So clearly, Consciousness, which expresses itself in carefully crafted words regularly, involves awareness and sometimes self-censorship. So this is when metaphor comes in. So again, there are three ways to perform metaphor research as I talked to you, as I told you, using naturally occurring data and all metaphor elicitation technique, which is verbal and visual. Now, uh, what uh, Prof. Uh, Zoltman did, he uh, offered a way of metaphor elicitation technique to um, in the interview with the customers. So uh, which one do you think he offered? Did he use the first method or the second verbal or the visual? He actually uh, offered a combination of A and B, that is verbal and visual together. So that is what is called ZMET, which stands for Zaltzman Metaphor Elicitation Technique, comprises of different steps. So before the interview, you ask the participants to bring five or six images that can represent the topic. You can give them a few days to prepare. And when they come to the interview, then they describe the content of relevant visual images and how they are associated with the research topic uh, you know, for their customer. So they bring a few images and then we ask them, what are the contents of each image? So they say, for example, this is the journey. There is a light at the end of this journey. And then we become aware of what elements in that image is important to them. So what Zaltman did was connecting the verbal and the visual metaphors or the verbal and visual ways of elicitation metaphors from the customers or the participants. Then, the customer sorts images into meaningful groups, okay? And then the customer identifies what is and what is not a good sensory representation of their research topic. So for example, sounds 
shapes, for example, tactile sensation, color, taste, smell, scent. So for example, they say that in this image, I can hear, for example, the bird chirping or etc. Or in here or in this image, I can sense, for example, the smell of the coffee. Because these are apparently in your unconscious mind, but we cannot see them in the image. Then in the next step, the customer indicates which picture from a given set of pictures is the most representative of the research topic. For example, the meaning of luxury, for example, or uh, for example, I don't know, the meaning of comfort, for example, if they are talking about a car or sofa. Then the customer describes relevant pictures that he or she was unable to find or obtain and explain the relevance. So for example, they say, I think that, for example, this uh, image could be also used here, but I couldn't find any relevant images. Then the customer identifies pictures that describe the opposite of the topic. For example, what is not luxury? Or for example, when I did, um, I did a study on my students regarding online learning um, as opposed to face-to-face -face, uh, learning. So it was like, what is online learning? And then what is not online learning? That is what is face-to-face -face learning. Then the customer describes what a company and or key people for example, car designer, sales personnel, think of the customer. This is important because the customer's response to a company is also influenced by this perception. So the customer say, what do the company and, and the key people think of me? Then the customer describes the single most important message that they want to convey their message to the company. So from among the set of the pictures, we ask the customers which one is the most important picture that you want, for example, to uh, that represents this, for example, product or this company, and you want to send a message to that company. Then the customer describes which of his or her feelings or thoughts uh, a relevant company is least prepared to hear. That is, which um, feelings or thoughts the company is least prepared to hear is not willing or is the least prepared to hear. Then the customer would provide a mental map. Here is a, a sample of the mental map. The customer creates a map or a cause, causal model using the constructs which have been elicited to express the customer's overall thinking about the research topic. So this is done by the customer. So during the interview, we can come to such a, a mental map by the customer. Then um, there will be the creation of a summary image. So the customer with the aid of a technician can create a single um, image. So this image can have uh, the elements, all of the elements that actually he has been using. For example, you can see here, there is one element here and there is this element and this one. So the customer will provide a summary image of all of the images that he brought to the interview. So this one can be done uh, with the aim of a computer and a technician. So for example, put this here, because for example, this piece of cake means, uh, for example, is related to this party and this party represents, for example, excitement, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally will be the creation of a consensus map. So this is done by the researcher based on all of the uh, research. So this would be done for all of the participants. So the diagrammatic metaphor representing uh, the researcher's understanding of customer thinking. It consists of customers, most important constructs, and their interrelationship. It describes most of the thinking of most customers. It is an integration of information provided by all customers participating in a project. So that is it, that is the whole uh, ZMAT, which is um, done in the form of interview. And then the final words, <clears throat> metaphor is a very effective research tool to identify the unconscious thoughts of the participants. And ZMAT can be used for many other fields of research rather than only market research. So of course, uh, uh, the topic of this talk is 
uh, customers mind. But um, ZMED can be used for other research. For example, I give you one example here. What students want a vision of a future online learning experience? So this one was done by conducting a Zoltman metaphor elicitation technique. Or as another one, Zoltman metaphor elicitation technique used to reveal the uh, link lectures, clinical professors, and first year students on a spoken thoughts as images. Thank you very much.